In 1976, a 14-year-old boy pinned a notice up at Mount Temple Comprehensive School in Dublin. He was looking for musicians to start a new band. The boy was Larry Mullen Jr. Seven musicians turned up to the first band practice in Mullen's parents' kitchen. Among them were Paul Hewson, Adam Clayton and Dave Evans. These four teenagers formed a band which would go on to sell more than 170 million albums worldwide and win more Grammy Awards than any other band. The band is U2 and Paul Hewson, the frontman, is Bono. But perhaps what eclipses the band's musical success is the unique and groundbreaking work Bono and U2 have done for more than 20 years in campaigning for human rights and social justice. This is the story of the other side of the band. It's the story of Bono and U2's never-ending energy, drive and commitment to social causes. It's the story of a charismatic performer who takes his talents into the world of politics. And finally, it's the story of how a massively successful stadium rock act turned their success into money for the poor. Just, you know, to use your star power for people who have no power at all, it's got to be a good thing. I mean, I'm as sick of celebrities as the next man, and I am one, I suppose, although I hate that word. But, you know, it's ridiculous to have this thing called celebrity, but it's currency, and, and I want to spend mine wisely. Bono and U2 have been extremely successful in raising awareness and in changing world policies around hunger, poverty, and social justice abuse. Capping the many awards and honours he has received over the years, Bono was named Time Magazine Person of the Year in 2005, alongside Bill and Melinda Gates. He was not awarded the accolade for his contribution to music, but because he has used his talents to do amazing work as an ambassador and crusader for the world's poor and disadvantaged. However, the decision to bestow such an honour on a pop musician instead of other favoured contenders like Bill Clinton raised a few eyebrows. Steve Kirp, deputy managing editor of Time, admitted it was unusual to put Bono alongside the world's richest couple. Bono made it cool to care about poor people, and especially about extremely poor people. And uh, what he did is he, he leveraged his own incredible celebrity to um, really uh, persuade politicians around the world of rich countries to relieve the debts of poor countries, like to the tune of $40 billion. And what this did is it relieved all those poor countries uh, of these huge debts and enabled them to spend the money on education and health and lots of other things that would have been neglected. Debt relief for African nations is only one string to Bono and U2's guitar. But what makes these talented musicians such skilled politicians? Perhaps the answer lies in the band's unique makeup. Part of what is special about U2 is the fact that they still have the same lineup as they did back in 1976. In 2006, U2 had to cancel a concert in Australia. Par for the course, perhaps, for other bands where hedonistic lifestyles can take their toll, but a very rare event for U2. But the band did not even consider replacing one of their brothers with a local musician, even though they were far from home. Well, I can't really get into the details of why a family member was very ill and uh, there was a lot of distress and angst. And the good news is, I think I can announce tonight, we, we, you know, we're, we're, we are coming back. Looks like November. And um, that's a great relief to me. I didn't want to leave Australia without having that hammered down. But but um, I'm just about that much away from being able to give you the dates. Which brings up another of the reasons you 2 make such successful crusaders. They have a famously warm relationship with their fans. Reassuring the faithful that U2 would return, Bono went on to show the kind of respect and love for the band's fan base that has helped to define U2. You know, it's, it's only happened once before, and oddly enough, it was in Sydney in Australia in uh, the late 80s. We had to postpone three dates. It makes you feel ill. It's, it's against everything. It's, it's, just, it's, it's really, it's hard to describe how, uh, how awful it feels. And we're a very close relationship with our fans-based thing. It's, it's quite a thing, the U2 thing. And uh, it, 
I'm amazed, actually, that people have been so kind to us and on the websites and people, people really don't care. They just care. Is everything going to be okay? And for those who have to travel and change travel arrangements, we're really, really, really deeply sorry. Fans of all ages and generations hold you two close to their hearts. These faithful followers lined up for hours to experience the U2 Popmark Tour, which opened in Vegas in 1997. The biggest, these are the biggest U2 fans beyond me that I am familiar with, yes, big U2 fans. I think this concert has a lot to do with excess and glamour and glitz and the whole theatrics of it in Vegas. What, I mean, what better place in Vegas? I mean, glamour, glitz, here it is, right here. No doubt they saved up again to buy tickets to the hugely successful Vertigo World Tour in 2005. The album of that tour, All That You Can't Leave Behind, went on to win eight Grammy Awards. What they stand for, the way they evolve, what they mean to my wife and I. We have two kids because of them. Thanks, guys. <laughs> because they're just really good. They make an incredible spiritual songs. They've got a gift that's like no other band. You two not only break cultural and generational borders, they also have a huge fan base amongst the glitterati, with stars like Christian Slater, Sigourney Weaver, Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee turning out to see them play. Although they probably didn't have to line up for their tickets. In 1997, U2 became the first international act to play in Bosnia after the war ended, and they didn't just play. They treated Sarajevo to a full-scale concert from their Popmark tour, trucking the massive stage show over mountains in 15 buses and 32 trucks. By bringing the tour to Sarajevo, Bono fulfilled a personal promise he had made to the city when he visited on New Year's Eve in 1995. Not only did they bring all their equipment over the mountains, U2 promised that all the proceeds from the concert would go to the charity War Child, set up to help child victims of the Bosnian War. You know, it's just a miracle that we're here, really, in a way. It's been uh, weeks and, of planning by uh, our own people and all the, the people in, in the city, so it's great that we can, we can do it. In the lead-up to the show, Dave Evans, a.k.a. The Edge, proved that he's just as good at staying on message as he is playing riffs. And he also showed that Bono is not U2's only mouthpiece. Well, I hope it's an indicator that um, normality is coming back to a city that's seen an awful lot of um, hardship and uh, a lot of really extreme uh, things have happened to this city and its people. So... You know, the fact that we can come and put on not just a concert, but the same concert that we put on in Paris, and New York, and London, I think is a, maybe a symbol for, for the people of Sarajevo that things are getting back to normal. One of the reasons Bono and U2 are so adored by their fans is that they have all managed to hang on to what some critics have called the common touch. Bono refuses to take himself too seriously. Nowadays, he is never seen out without his sunglasses. His trademark signature eyewear has developed throughout his career, graduating from very dark sunglasses he sported in the early U2 days to the pale tinted lenses he favors now. More than aware that this sartorial habit could be labeled pretentious, Bono claims he wears them to protect his sensitive eyes. He admits, however, that he wears them partly for privacy and partly out of vanity, and he's turned what might be seen as an affectation into a very successful running joke. It's standard practice to bring gifts to people of power, but instead of gold, frankincense or myrrh, Bono comes bearing designer sunglasses. He's given sunglasses to presidents, prime ministers, and even the Pope. You are a great showman, as well as a great holy man. And that is for you, and also my glasses, I give to you. While some dignitaries have been taken aback at being presented with such a strange gift, former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe played it cool. I was surprised. He gave me twice the time I was asking for. And, and he surprised me even further when putting on my sunglasses that I gave to him. 
because I've always seen George Bush looking at my sunglasses like this, <laughs> but George Bush never put them on. <laughs> the Pope, the last Pope, John Paul, he put them on, and Prime Minister Abe. Very cool. Although the band members are now all rich as Croesus, they are well aware that the budgets of many of their fans won't stretch as far as forking out for concert tickets to see U2 play live. To give everyone a chance to see them up close and personal, the band commissioned a 3D concert film which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2008. It's the closest some fans will ever get to seeing them live. Also, U2 tickets are a bit expensive and hopefully this will be a, a cheaper ticket for people to experience. I'm just thinking of people going to high school or going to college who don't have the cash. We fight to have the tickets at a reasonable price, like at least 50, 60 percent of them, but you know the way it goes, the tickets get sold on and, and there's not enough of them. So I hope for people who are just thinking, well, I'm kind of into that band, I'm, I, you know, that they'll give us a shot and come and see what we've got. Bono and The Edge joked that the movie would at last give them a chance to see one of their concerts. Yeah, Edge was saying he'd never seen a U2 show and that this... I was, I was really hoping we weren't crap after all these years. Just luckily we weren't. And, and, and I guess this is the closest thing to it because it's not the usual remove that you have with a concert film. It's kind of total immersion. You're, you're right in the middle of it. You're not just in the best seat. You're in, there's a, let's say there's 100 seats. One of them's on stage, one's in the front, one's on the back, one's at the... Dr I mean, it's... it's a, a, you, you couldn't be closer. And if you don't like this band, I can't imagine a more horrible experience. U2's massive musical success is well documented. But what makes them trailblazers in a world of rock and roll is the commitment to raising awareness of world issues that began way back in 1984 when Bono sang on the Band Aid single Do They Know It's Christmas, which raised money for famine relief in Ethiopia. In fact, Bono's understanding of how he could use his star profile to make a difference dates back to 1979, when at the age of 19, he watched a comedy benefit for Amnesty International staged by John Cleese. Since then, Bono has gone on to become the only person in living history to have been nominated for an Academy Award, Golden Globe, Grammy and the Nobel Peace Prize. And these are only the best known of the many honors he has received. Bono has famously been called the face of fusion philanthropy. Fusion because he doesn't just fight the humanitarian battle on one front, but on several. He has been the ideas man and driving force behind a number of organizational networks and business ventures which combine profit with activism to provide win-win solutions for everyone. Like all brilliant salesmen, he doesn't appear to be selling anything at all. Yet over the past 20 years, he's been doggedly touting everything from famine relief and peace in Northern Ireland to ending the African debt and facilitating the supply of cheap drugs to combat the AIDS epidemic. Bono knows when to flatter and when to step back. He has a knack for knowing when his powerful friends need encouragement and when they need pushing to close a deal. He also knows when to accentuate the positive. <laughs> After years of experience on the world stage, he knows flattery wins more hearts than being dictatorial. In the next few weeks. On speaking to the press after visiting Prime Minister Abe, he focused on the fact that Japan had taken the global lead in setting up a fund to give hundreds of thousands of AIDS patients access to life-changing drugs which had previously been too expensive. The world doesn't understand that Japan <clears throat> has had a lot of success in its um, aid and assistance in Southeast Asia in particular, and that there's a lot we can learn from Japan in applying this to the, the rest of the developing world. In the same interview, Bono explained that his motivation for change came from his fan base and squeezed in a plug for his pet causes. I, I'm a musician, you know, we play music. I, as I have gotten to know the people who come to our concerts, this is really true that, that younger people uh, are looking for meaning in, in a very meaningless world. And they think it's insane that 8,000 people are dying every day 
of a preventable, treatable disease, AIDS. For lack of drugs, you can get here easily. Or that 5,000, mostly children, are dying every day of a mosquito bite, malaria, number one killer. They think that's mad. Bono knows we can't all stand up and be heard, but he can. His privileged status as a rich and famous musician keeps the eyes and ears of the world trained upon him, perhaps even more effectively than Sir Bob Geldof, who has given up his music career to concentrate solely on his humanitarian efforts. Bono has said publicly more than once that he doesn't like the term celebrity, but he also knows that his star status gives him unique access to some of the world's most powerful and influential people. Politicians and heads of state find themselves in a strange situation. They make time to meet a rock star to talk international aid. But if they don't agree with him, they look bad in the eyes of their public. In 2002, Los Angeles held music awards to recognize acts like U2 that have managed to straddle the worlds of music and social justice. Love Rocks, celebrating the biggest hearts in entertainment, seemed refreshingly free of the cool cynicism that so many rock industry people affect. Instead, the awards celebrated a unique bunch of musicians who use their celebrity power to fight for world causes. Bono received the aptly named Heart of Entertainment Award, and ever the salesman, he started off by paying tribute to LA. I'm very proud, I'm very humbled. I, I, I love, you know, Los Angeles. And it's the place where they sold the American dream to the world, you know? This is, this is the city I really love, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Although the flashing cameras probably play havoc with his sensitive eyes, Bono also knows a good photo opportunity helps keep him and his agenda top of mind. Bono is a great example. A guy who uh, has it all and gives it, gives it back. You know, and you can tell he does it from, from the heart, so that's good. Yeah, and I'm honored to be here, really. Let me introduce to you one of my favorite citizens of the world. We hail you, and we're honored to share this night with you, so get out here and be Bono! Aside from catching up with his powerful friends, events like these provide the perfect opportunity to remind everyone of the work that needs to be done. And as always, he came well-researched and well-rehearsed. Just the other week, your Secretary of the Treasury, Paul O'Neill, actually referred to me a, a, as a serious person. And that's... that's hard. That, that, that hurts. <laughs> I, I think what, what he what he might have meant what he might have meant was a serious pain in the and I certainly was a serious pain in the for the last Secretary of the Treasury and I and I and I'm certainly a thorn in the shoe of uh, this administration and uh, and the next one I hope. Two thousand and two was also the year that the BBC conducted a public poll to choose the hundred greatest Britons, and Bono, an Irishman, came in at number eighty-six. No doubt he was a bit miffed that Sir Bob Geldof came in at seventy-five. In two thousand and five, U two were incredibly busy touring their massive live show Vertigo, but Bono somehow found the time to campaign around the EU Leaders Summit to urge the member countries of the European Union to meet the new target of 0.7% of gross national income on development aid by 2015. This would boost aid by 20 billion euros a year from 2010. While on the surface, it may have seemed an unrealistic goal, spread between the populations of the member countries, it amounted to a cost of around 49 euros per person. Bono appeared alongside the European Commission President, Jose Manuel Barroso, to deliver his message and packed out the press room. Sick to death of dull but worthy political speeches, the media clamoured for photos and sound bites from the rock musician and even gave him a round of applause. This is a moment, this is a generation that wants to have something to be remembered for. What else in 50 years' time will we be remembered for? Will, will we re the internet? the war against terror, 
Could this be the generation that actually says no to stupid poverty, to extreme poverty, to a child dying for lack of food in its belly in the 21st century? I think that's the generation I want to be re remembered for, and that's what uh, I would like to say to the finance ministers. Don't blow it. And, uh, put, put down your national flags, look up from the numbers, and see the future. Bono has always known that he leaves himself open to criticism, and part of that criticism centers around the sheer magnitude of the problems he is trying to solve. Many people think he's attempting the impossible, but he's always happy to take on the naysayers. 120,000 people lose their lives every month in Africa, and it's not a natural uh, calamity. These are avoidable catastrophes. So that's my motivation, is the chance that that we can do this. It's not wide-eyed, misty-eyed Irish nonsense. It, it, it's, 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 it, these are achievable goals, and, uh, and I'm excited by that. That's what turns me on. You get the feeling with Bono that the more ambitious the challenge, the more he feels inspired. Developing long-lasting alliances demands a high degree of maintenance, like remembering people's names, details about their families, or staying in touch with what's been happening since the last visit. Despite the fact that Bono meets umpteen people every year, he's careful to come prepared. In 2006, he returned to Chile after a long absence to accept the Pablo Neruda Order of Artistic Merit and Culture. It's just an extraordinary thing um, to be here after eight years and see how, how much has changed. It's like a, a different country, and I love the old country. Um, the old country, I was, you know, taken by the passion of the people and the uh, landscapes um, that's where the beauty was to be found um, but it seems this time that there's beauty to be found in, in institutions and um, in the justice system and even just being on the roads from the airport you just felt these these roads could go everywhere and I don't want to be simple about, uh, about a country that I don't know enough about. I know it's a complex country, Chile, and I know that uh, I know that Pablo Neruda was a complex poet, and as I see the new Chile, I am very humbled, very moved, and very excited to play some rock and roll tonight. Thank you very much. The rock and roll that Bono and U2 were looking forward to playing was in the National Stadium in Santiago de Chile. And this venue was specially chosen by U2 because of its grim associations with General Pinochet, who ran Chile with a strong and bloody hand. In 1973, the stadium, which should have been a rock and sport venue, became a bloodbath of detention, torture and death. U2 helped turn the space back into a centre for celebration. This kind of local knowledge detail is seen again and again as Bono and the band travel the world trailing a huge team of dedicated managers and administrative staff who make sure everything goes off without a hitch. You can sometimes see one or two hard-working assistants scurrying around, ushering Bono in and out of rooms, making sure he's at the right place at the right time. Making friends in high places often requires a bit of diplomacy. In 2002, Bono made a visit to the French president, Jacques Chirac, who had just won another election with a landslide victory. Bono knew that the right time to talk to the president would be straight after his triumph. However, he also knew that persuading the centre-right president to give promised aid might not be an easy task. I feel that our moments, this time that we're in, uh, will be remembered probably for three things. The war against terror, I guess the internet, and how we let an entire continent burst into flames while we stood around with watering cans. And, you know, the scale of the response has to match the scale of the problem. He was careful not to make any grand sweeping statements after his talk with President Chirac. He said that he is ready to give more money and, and 
and he wants to do it in concert though um, with the other uh, leaders some of them he feels are dragging their heels at the moment the United States is as a percentage it gives the least of all the rich countries France is, has been generous um, but in the last years has gone down he promised me if they would reverse that trend and uh, I'm very happy about that his words found their target and Chirac said afterwards that he found Bono a convincing and eloquent advocate for poor countries. Bono also has important friends among his peers in the world of music, film and television. He was surrounded by plenty of household names when he made this advertisement for his fellow rock star philanthropist Bob Geldof in 2005. So Bob certainly called on all his famous friends for the campaign, in which celebrities like Brad Pitt, Hugh Grant, Claudia Schiffer, and George Clooney clicked their fingers once, with each click representing the death of a child in the world due to poverty. All of this was in aid of Geldof's campaign, Making Poverty History. The Boomtown Rats frontman first came to the fore as a rabid activist through raising money and awareness during Ethiopia's 1984-85 famine. In 1985, he masterminded the legendary Live Aid concerts, which raised £150 million for famine relief. Since then, he and Bono have worked on a number of philanthropic projects together. A little more rough around the edges, Sir Bob is not afraid of calling a spade a spade, which has not made him quite as welcome to the boardrooms and gilded halls that the more diplomatic Bono has access to. In fact, Bono is so palatable to the elite that he was suggested as a possible successor to outgoing World Bank head James Wolfenson. With influential friends and a fan base to die for, Bono is no doubt the target of envy on both the political and musical stage. Kylie's in Munich tonight showing this ad. The U2 guys are going out on one of the biggest tours ever. They're showing it every night. Keen are doing it every night. Mac Fly. So it goes right across the pop spectrum. Every pub, every town hall, every theatre, every stadium. This year, every gig is Live Aid, and we're bringing it home. Other famous and influential friends Bono has made along the way include Condoleezza Rice. You'd think a working-class boy from Dublin would be a little overawed to find himself a guest of the US State Department, but Bono remained his usual relaxed self. He found himself in elevated company again, albeit in a more informal setting, with Annie Lennox and Nelson Mandela. As Mandela's lifetime crusade to end apartheid in South Africa has influenced the work of Bono, no doubt the singer's own charisma, energy and talent will inspire many young rockers embarking on their own careers. Just how many younger artists make the crossover into aid work is yet to be seen. But when Bono gets serious, he leaves behind any lingering ghosts of bloated, self-indulgent, ego-driven rock stars and follows in the footsteps of a long line of great political orators, which includes Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy. This is a real moment in time um, where it is possible, if we want to, to be the first generation that says no to extreme poverty. And by extreme poverty, we mean, you know, stupid poverty. You know, kids dying for like food in their belly in the 21st century or whatever it is, 3,000 Africans, mostly children, dying every day of a mosquito bite. That is ridiculous. And history has a way of looking, as I said earlier, as a way of making things that looked acceptable uh, once appear ridiculous. Now, this is that moment. And, you know, it, other ages they had, you know, they, uh, they could pull back apartheid or with the the fight for equality and civil rights in the United States that defined the 60s and 70s. This is our shot at greatness. Perhaps what is most amazing about Bono and his philanthropic work is his sheer bloody-minded persistence. For over 20 years, he has been knocking on the doors of world leaders, asking them to consider his proposals. 
Some of these campaigns have been highly successful, others less so. But Bono keeps coming back. He knows that meaningful change can take a long time. Here is some early footage of him and other members of U2 literally getting down and dirty with Greenpeace as they protest the contamination of the local soil from the nuclear power plant at Sellafield in the UK. More recently, U2 added their support to the Yes referendum in Northern Ireland in 1998 by staging a unique concert that brought together 2,500 young Protestants and Catholics to encourage them to vote yes for the peace referendum. Having grown up with the Northern Ireland fighting right on his doorstep, this must have felt like a very personal mission. In 1999, Bono worked around his usual hectic music schedule to make sure he was in Germany to campaign hard before the G8 summit, which was the first gathering of world leaders since the end of the Kosovo War. There were a lot of vocal demonstrations on the normally quiet Cologne streets, and Bono was in the thick of it all. In a ceremony for press and public, he handed German Chancellor and summit host Gerhard Schroeder a bag of petitions containing thousands of signatures to pressure the G8 leaders to agree to write off all third world debt. It, it, it's a funny old world, Chancellor, when pop stars get such attention and the ideas that we hear today promoted get so little. Uh, he delivered 17 million signatures. He represents 1 million people. We believe history will be very hard on world leaders who might miss this opportunity. We don't believe you will. While the leaders of the richest countries in the world met with Russia about how to ease its debt, Bono joined other celebrities and members of the public to form a 70,000-person human chain around the centre of Cologne. There's no doubt it's always much more fun out on the front line, but most of the hard campaigning work, as Bono would know, is done in long and drawn-out talks behind closed doors. It must have been deja vu for Bono when he was back in Germany in 2007 for another G8 summit, and he remembers those heady days with nostalgia. Die Welt schaut auf Deutschland. G8, G8s in Germany are a great thing for Germany, but also for the rest of the world. Eight years ago in Cologne, people stood arm in arm, marched together, all kinds of Germans, all kinds of Europeans, and we had a breakthrough deal for the world's poor. Aware of his longevity on the public stage and the fact that he pops up all over the world like some kind of international jack-in-the-box, he jokes that everyone will soon be sick of him, but that's all part of his job. We will, myself, Herbert Grunemeyer and other Germans, will be over the next months um, pain in your <laughs> I'm sure. And, um, but this is our job, and I know you respect it, and we respect yours. After Bono's promise to be a pain in the butt, what the 2007 G8 leaders actually brought back to the table fell far short of what many hoped for. Many seasoned campaigners, among them Bob Geldof, felt totally betrayed. Only two years earlier, at the Glen Eagles conference, promises had been made to double development aid, and now it was clear that the powers that be had reneged. What happened over the last two days was bollocks. The climate success, it's not my expertise, but are you joking me? That they will seriously consider the European position? That's a triumph. What bottom line are we driving down to where we, we reject the future of the world and the poor within it? What bottom line does this G8 find every year? Bono is so much more measured in his response. Perhaps they have some sort of backstage agreement to play good cop, bad cop. Or maybe it is simply that Bono has learnt that patience and tact are among some of the most important skills of a serious campaigner. 
especially one who intends to last the distance. It's amazed. This labyrinthine language is a maze that's deliberate. We are supposed to get lost in this maze. And our movement of people that were gathered here in various different stripes and colors, we, we don't all agree on everything. But this maze is designed to lose us, but we are not lost. They are lost. The G8 are lost. So often, campaigning is just hard work with no visible results. Sitting down to endless meetings, shuffling papers, toting up figures, arguing over promises made and not fulfilled, and shaking hands until your hand aches. It must be thrilling to get out of the boardroom and away from all the statistics and glum public servant faces and finally see some results of all this hard work. In 2006, Bono got out of the office to visit Rwanda. The stop was part of a tour across six African states to see how his campaign for debt relief was working on the ground and in the villages of ordinary African people. In Rwanda, he met with health officials to hear about their response to the AIDS pandemic. He was clearly happy with the progress that is being made. It's very, 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 very exciting and almost overwhelming to see the work come to come home uh, as it has here in Rwanda. Our work, meaning getting out on the streets, uh, making your case for you to people who are a little deaf to your needs. Um, sometimes their, their hearts are open, um, but their wallets are closed. Um, we work to achieve open hearts, open minds, and open walls. He just doesn't like them. Famous friends held close is one side of the Bono success story. But he's called the face of fusion philanthropy precisely because he fights the war across a number of fronts. One of those fronts is his organization of commercial enterprises which combine profit making with humanitarian relief. In other words, he gets into bed with big business in order to sell us products. Some of the profits from those sales go to the causes that he champions. It's a model that keeps everyone happy. One such project is RED. In 2006, he joined forces with Bobby Shriver, the nephew of former US President John F. Kennedy. And with the assistance of talk show queen Oprah Winfrey, he launched RED in the American marketplace. Bono and Shriver teamed up with four global corporations, Motorola, Gap, Giorgio Armani and Converse to launch a new product range. A percentage of the profits from these products, labelled and coloured red, go to a fund used to fight AIDS. In the UK, American Express also joined in with a special red credit card. People want to do the right thing. A lot of people think people want to do the wrong thing and they want to do a bad thing. They really don't. They want to do the right thing. And what RED enables people to do is the right thing in their daily life. They're buying phones anywhere. They're buying T-shirts anywhere. They're going to be buying, God willing, cosmetics and other kinds of products anyway. So you just, as B said, you upgrade your choice. You pick the RED version of that thing. At the launch, Bono and Oprah took a little shopping trip on the famous Chicago strip, The Magnificent Mile. The cameras and fans were all lined up because as Bono and his colleagues know, the only way to get the message through is to make sure the revolution is televised. And what better way to encourage the public to open up its wallet than to have two high-profile trendsetters buy and use the merchandise? You know, what's great about Red is I'm not asking you um, to give money or write a check for charity. I'm asking you to buy Red products, and the companies who make those products will be writing a check to charity. That's so cool. And of course, if you tell your friends and more and more people buy Red products, well, then those companies do well, um, but so do we. Red products went on sale first in Britain and raised around $10 million before Bono and Shriver took the products to America. Bono, always optimistic, counted on the fact that ordinary Americans wanted to do their bit to help fight and prevent AIDS in the developing world. 
we must demonstrate to the wider world in America that we are a good people, we've got good values, and we're not going to let 6,500 Africans die every day of a preventable, treatable disease. We're not going to do it. It's not American, it's not Irish, it's not English. It's not acceptable. We've got the drugs, let's get them the drugs. In the UK, even phone calls on special red phones raised money for the AIDS Global Fund. It's estimated that donating just 5% of the user's yearly phone bill could raise enough money to buy medicine to prevent 180 cases of mother-to-child transmissions of HIV. You, do, you just get your SIM card and stick it in the phone. You don't have to change your number, but you can change the world for somebody who really needs their world to be changed, i.e. if you have AIDS in Africa and you're dying right now, making a phone call can really help pay for those drugs. Bono knows that first and foremost, he's a rock star. And this public identity has its problems when he's chasing money for his philanthropy. In 2005, the author Paul Thoreau published an article accusing Bono, among others, of mythomania, a desperate need to prove their worthiness to the world. It's like water off a duck's back for Bono, who in an interview with Times Online in 2006, called his detractors cranks carping from the sidelines. But it is an emergency, the AIDS thing. People say, you know, I love your cause. It's not a cause. Six and a half thousand Africans dying every day is not a cause. It's an emergency. So we need, we need to think differently and we need to get, get on the problem from every angle. Thinking about the problem from every angle is exactly what Bono did for another one of his entrepreneurial drives. In 2005, along with his wife, Ali Hewson, and Irish fashion designer, Rogan Gregory, Bono launched a fashion label, Eden, in answer to some of his critics who claimed that handing money to Africa only encourages corruption and dependency. Bono's new enterprise reflected a shifting mood globally, moving away from simple handouts to strengthening trade and local manufacturing, therefore providing more long-term and sustainable futures. Figuring that everyone likes new gear, Bono and his partners designed a range of stylish clothing made in factories in Africa, South America and India. These factories all offer fair wages to workers and practice good business sense. Bono was pretty surprised, to say the least, when he and his wife won a special award from the Fashion Oscars, the Council of Fashion Designers of America Awards in 2007. Bono took to the world stage, always leading by example. And now with their socially conscious clothing line, Eden, Ellie and Bono have showed our fashion industry the importance of making clothes according to the ethical trade standards. Not able to make the event, the pair sent their thanks via video link to the gathered celebrities and fashionistas. This truly was a rare event, as Bono's wife is notoriously camera shy. This is a real honour for a grubby musician from the north side of Dublin. By far, the most stylish thing about me is my missus. Um, and it's Ali that's done uh, such an incredible job um, with Eden. This tiny little company that we started with outrageously big ambitions. Um, people would like to think um, that they can make a difference in the lives of the poorest, most vulnerable people by buying a T-shirt or a jacket, but the jacket and the T-shirt and the jeans have to look good. He and Ali have been together for over 30 years and have four children together. Many creative people feel that their work gives them back more than they put into it, so perhaps the music feeds energy back into him. It must also be immensely energising to receive the recognition and awards that give him yet more opportunities to spruik his causes to the world. The year after he was named Time Magazine Person of the Year, he was awarded an honorary British knighthood. And in 2008, he received an honorary Doctor of Law degree from Keio University, one of Japan's top public universities. The irony was not lost on him. When President Anza allowed an Irish rock star outlaw to become an honorary doctorate in law. It's funny. I pretended I was a student at Trinity College in Dublin because when I was in uh, this little post-punk rock group, 
uh, I could eat in the buttery free of charge if I told them I was a student. So I have to tell you, this doctor of law has been breaking the law <laughs> in his time in college. With the going getting tough in the global economy, many countries are tightening their financial belts, and often the first thing to go is international aid. There is also the problem of aid fatigue. The only person showing no sign of aid fatigue is Bono, who remains, as always, optimistic. Now, on global health, we haven't had a uh, we haven't had a great um, a great start. Your government announced last week that its new commitment to the global fund, um, the mechanism you just saw at work there. Um, we were disappointed. The announcement was neither clear nor ambitious enough, uh, given the scale of the disease. We hope that this will be fixed in the next few weeks. In the same visit, Bono took the opportunity to get out of the rarefied political air and get down and dirty with his fans, to take on the kind of grassroots campaigning that he enjoys the most. These occasions give him a chance to get his message across to a new generation that will see their world go through incredible changes. And if Bono and U2 have their way, it will come out a much better place.